Let's begin with a few questions. In the US, workers can generally be discharged for good cause, no cause, and even a morally wrong cause. The answer is true. This is called employment at will. 2. After 1890, a key weapon against unionization, was the injunction or a court order, to cease and desist activities, deemed to be potentially harmful, to others. The answer is true. This was done based on the Sherman Antitrust Act. 3. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, was often used against unions, by treating them as a monopoly, when they tried to exert pressure on an employer, using tactics, such as boycotts and strikes. The answer is true, through the use, of court injunctions. 4. Both the union and the employer, are responsible for determining which employees, will be included in the bargaining unit, and therefore have rights, to vote in a union election. The answer is false. It is the NLRB's responsibility, to determine bargaining units. 5. Community of interest, refers to a principle used by the NLRB, to define bargaining units, to ensure that the employer and employees, can find common ground, over issues that need to be negotiated. The answer is false. Community of interest is a common interest among a group of employees on factors such as duties, skills, working conditions, and other job-related issues, which are considered by the NLRB, in determining whether the employees should be grouped together, as a bargaining unit. The Sherman Act of 1890, is an antitrust act. The basic objective of antitrust laws, is to protect the process of business competition, for the benefit of consumers, making sure there are strong incentives, for businesses to operate efficiently, keep prices down, and keep quality up. The aim of the Sherman Antitrust Act, was to preserve free and unfettered competition, as the rule of trade. The Act, outlaws every contract or conspiracy, in restraint of trade, and any monopolization, attempted monopolization, or conspiracy to monopolize trade. The Act broadly prohibits anti-competitive agreements, and unilateral conduct, that monopolizes or attempts to monopolize, the relevant market. It also attempts to prevent the artificial raising of prices, by restriction of trade, or supply. The purpose of the Sherman Act, is to preserve a competitive marketplace, to protect consumers, from abuses. The Sherman Antitrust Act, allowed injunctions, to be issued against any entity, that conspired to restrain trade. An injunction is a court order, requiring a person to do, or cease doing a specific action. These injunctions, were used against labor unions, to end strikes. The first instance was an injunction against the American Railway Union, to end its strike, against the Pullman Palace Car Company, in 1894. The Sherman Antitrust Act, authorizes the Department of Justice, to bring suits to prohibit conduct, violating the Act. Private parties, injured by conduct violating the Act, can bring suits for threefold damages, which means three times as much money in damages, as the violation cost them. The Clayton Act of 1914, is also an antitrust act. The act banned the practices of price discrimination, and anti-competitive mergers. It also declared strikes, boycotts, and labor unions, legal under federal law. The Clayton Act defines and prohibits unethical business practices, such as price fixing and monopolies, and limits the use of injunctions, to end strikes. The Clayton Act prohibits anti-competitive mergers, predatory, and discriminatory pricing, and other forms of unethical corporate behavior. The Clayton Act also protects individuals, by allowing lawsuits against companies, 
and upholding the rights of labor, to organize and protest peacefully. The Federal Trade Commission, FTC, and the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice, DOJ, enforce the provisions of the Clayton Antitrust Act. Boycotts, peaceful strikes, peaceful picketing, and collective bargaining, were allowed under the Clayton Act. And injunctions could only be used to settle labor disputes when property damage was threatened or occurred. Note a key difference between the Clayton Act and the Sherman Act. The Clayton Act contained safe harbors for union activities. A safe harbor is a provision in a law that affords protection from liability or penalty when certain conditions are met. Time for a few questions. The Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932 sought to remedy the imbalance between an employer and an individual worker by limiting the role of the courts in labor management relations. The answer is true. The Railway Labor Act of 1926 regulates labor management relations in the rail and airline industries. The answer is true. The Wagner Act is based on the assumption that individual workers and management are equals in the bargaining process. The answer is false. Most U.S. unions are organized through secret ballot elections administrated by the National Labor Relations Board. The answer is true. The NLRA prohibits recognition picketing because they are disruptive and costly to both employers and their employees. The answer is false. The Railway Labor Act of 1926 governs labor relations in the railroad and airline industries, not just railroads, but airlines also. The Act seeks to substitute bargaining, arbitration, and mediation, for strikes, in a bid to resolve labor disputes. The purpose of the RLA is to avoid interruptions of interstate commerce by providing for the prompt resolution of disputes between carriers and their employees. The RLA protects the right of employees within its ambit to organize and bargain collectively. The RLA's provisions are enforced and administered by the National Mediation Board, NMB, an independent federal agency. The RLA defers the ability of the parties to take self-action in bargaining disputes until they have completed a mandatory, elaborate process, inclusive of negotiations, mediation by the NMB, possible review by a Presidential Emergency Board PB, and 30-day cooling-off periods, which can occur thrice in the resolution process. A cooling-off period is an interval during which two people or groups who have a dispute attempt to settle their differences before taking further action. Strikes, lockouts, and other forms of self-action in the airline and railroad industries may occur only after the NMB has determined that further mediation would not be successful and after a cooling-off period of 30 days following NMB release from mediation. In some situations, the parties may be required to participate in a Presidential Emergency Board PB, and defer any self-help action until 30 days after the PEB makes its recommendation. Now for another set of questions. Collective bargaining agreements are legally binding contracts, the answer is true. Mandatory bargaining items include wages, hours, and the terms and conditions of employment, the answer is true. If a union proposes changes to a permissive bargaining issue, the employer must show a good faith effort to consider the proposal, the answer is false. Distributive, or hard, or positional bargaining, considers negotiations as a zero-sum game, the answer is true. The philosophy of integrative bargaining, is that both parties will be better off, if they can capitalize on their common interests in reaching an agreement, rather than focusing on their differences, the answer is true. Norris LaGuardia Act of 1932, also known as the Anti-Injunction Bill, banned yellow dog contracts, 
barred federal courts from issuing injunctions against nonviolent labor disputes, and established that employees are free to form unions without employer interference. Yellow Dog Contracts, where employees agree as a condition of employment not to join a labor union, were prohibited by the Norris LaGuardia Act. The Norris LaGuardia Act prevents federal courts from issuing injunctions against nonviolent labor disputes or strikes. Remember, the three provisions of the Norris LaGuardia Act are protecting workers' self organization and collective bargaining, removing jurisdiction from federal courts to issue injunctions in nonviolent labor disputes, and outlawing yellow dog contracts. Let's look at a couple of questions, shall we? If the NBA basketball players went out on strike to support the referees in their negotiations over wages and working conditions, it would be considered a sympathy strike, the answer is true. An economic strike is a strike that occurs when workers are unhappy with a country's general economic conditions and seek to apply pressure to government officials to improve the economy, the answer is false. Regardless of whether workers strike over mandatory or permissive bargaining issues, the NLRA protects their right to strike, and they cannot be discharged or disciplined for their strike activity, the answer is false. One explanation for the decline in strike activity in the U.S. is that employers are more likely to use strike replacements. And the potential cost of the strike to workers is greater than to employers, the answer is true. The National Labor Relations Act of 1935, also known as the Wagner Act, guarantees the right of private sector employees to organize into unions, engage in collective bargaining, and take collective action, for example strikes, boycotts, picketing, etc. The NLRA allows both union and non-union employees to engage in concerted activities. The NLRA defined and banned Employer Unfair Labor Practices (ULPs). The NLRA banned company unions. A company or yellow union is a worker organization which is dominated or influenced by an employer, and is therefore not an independent labor union. Such employer-dominated unions are prohibited by the NLRA. The NLRA established the National Labor Relations Board NLRB, to enforce its provisions. The NLRB does not initiate labor actions, it responds to labor charges and petitions, charges to prosecute violations of the NLRA, such as ULPs, and petitions to oversee the process by which employees decide whether to be represented by a labor union, i.e. representation elections. The NLRA applies to most private sector employers, including manufacturers, retailers, private universities, and health care facilities. The NLRA does not apply to federal, state, or local governments, employers who employ only agricultural workers, employers subject to the Railway Labor Act, i.e. interstate railroads and airlines, supervisors, domestic workers, and independent contractors. A yellow dog contract is a contract by a worker not to join or support a union. Yellow dog contracts were made illegal by the Norris LaGuardia Act. Under the Wagner Act of 1935, an employer does not have a legal obligation to make concessions in response to union demands during a bargaining session. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 did not Prohibit employers from expressing their views and opinions on unionization. To petition the NLRB for an election, a union must gather authorization cards from more than 50% of the employees, true or false. False. The correct percentage is 30%. A key principle of integrative bargaining is that the parties should focus on underscore in negotiations. Common interests. Integrated bargaining is a bargaining strategy in which parties collaborate to find a win win solution to their dispute. 
This strategy focuses on developing mutually beneficial agreements. Let's learn Employer Unfair Labor Practices, ULP. The National Labor Relations Act, NLRA, forbids employers from interfering with, or coercing employees, in the exercise of rights relating to organizing, or assisting a labor union, for collective bargaining purposes, or refraining from any such activity. Examples of Employer Unfair Labor Practices, ULP Threatening employees with loss of jobs or benefits, if they join or vote for a union, or engage in protected concerted activity. Threatening to close the plant, if employees select a union to represent them. Questioning employees about their union sympathies or activities, in circumstances that tend to interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees, in the exercise of their rights, under the Act. Promising benefits to employees, to discourage their union support. Punishing employees, because they engaged in union or protected concerted activity, filed unfair labor practice charges, or participated in an investigation conducted by the NLRB. Dominate or interfere, with the formation or administration of any labor union, or contribute financial or other support to it. Remember the acronym TIPS, TIPS. Employers cannot threaten, interrogate, promise, or spy on employees engaging in rights related to labor union activities, or concerted activities. Now, let's learn union unfair labor practices. For the National Labor Relations Act, labor unions may not restrain or coerce employees, in the exercise of their NLRA protected rights. Examples of Union Unfair Labor Practices Threats to employees that they will lose their jobs, unless they support the union. Seeking the punishment of an employee for not being a union member, even if the employee has paid, or offered to pay a lawful initiation fee, and periodic fees thereafter. Refusing to process a grievance, because an employee has criticized union officials, or because an employee is not a member of the union, in states where union security clauses are not permitted, which are, right-to-work states. Fining employees who have validly resigned from the union, for engaging in protected concerted activities, following their resignation, or for crossing an unlawful picket line. Engaging in picket line misconduct, such as threatening, assaulting, or barring non-strikers, from the employer's premises. Striking over issues unrelated to employment terms and conditions, or coercively involving neutral parties, into a labor dispute. Time for a few questions. A union contract provision, that requires employees to join the union, after a certain amount of time on the job, is known as a Union Shop Clause if a group of employees is represented by a union, and another union that has a better track record, also wants to represent those workers, the employees, must stick with the union they have, until the contract expires. The Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, was passed primarily in response to unethical and illegal behaviors of unions. A strategy of working toward remaining non-union, is known as Union Avoidance Most U.S. unions are formed through Secret ballot elections Concerted means jointly arranged Concerted labor activity is protected by the NLRA it means an employee has the right to act with co-workers to address work-related issues in many ways. Examples include Talking with one or more co-workers about wages and benefits or other working conditions. Circulating a petition asking for better hours, participating in a concerted refusal to work in unsafe conditions. Openly talking about pay and benefits and joining with co-workers to talk directly to the employer, to a government agency, 
or to the media, or social media, about problems in the workplace. The employer cannot discharge, discipline, or threaten the employee for, or coercively question him or her about, this protected concerted activity. Generally, it takes two or more employees to engage in protected concerted activity, but a single employee may also engage in protected concerted activity, if he or she is acting on the authority of other employees, bringing group complaints to the employer's attention, trying to induce group action, or seeking to prepare for group action. However, an employee can lose protection by saying or doing something egregiously offensive, or knowingly, and maliciously false, or by publicly disparaging the employer's products or services, without relating the complaints to any labor controversy. Let's look at a court case you might see on your exams. Electromation Incorporated had five action committees to deal with areas such as wages, incentive pay, attendance programs, and leave policies. There were five employees, a management representative, and the employee's benefits manager on each committee. The Teamsters Union claimed recognition at Electromation Incorporated, which was not unionized. Teamsters also filed an unfair labor practice charge against Electromation's action committees, stating they were unlawful company unions under the NLRA. Remember, the NLRA banned employer-dominated labor organizations. The National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, held that the action committees were indeed unlawful employer-dominated labor organizations. Because the committees included employees and managers as members. The employer provided support, determined the goals and could reject committee proposals. The employer expected committee members to represent other co-workers. And the committee discussed conditions of work. Did you know? Under the NLRA, any person, except an employee of the NLRB, may file a ULP charge with the NLRB, within six months of the event, that constitute the basis of the charge. Time for a few questions. A typical union contract will not specify how union stewards will be selected. The right of workers to pay only the amount of dues, that goes toward collective bargaining and contract administration is called Beck rights. Union and agency shop agreements are intended to minimize the dash problem that arises from a union's duty of fair representation. The answer is free rider. Which of the following union security clauses requires a potential employee to be a union member before they are hired? Closed shop. Closed shops were made illegal by the Taft-Hartley Act, or LMRA. An agreement that requires employees to settle disputes with their employer, using arbitration instead of a lawsuit, is known as Mandatory Arbitration Agreement. Unions have a duty to represent all employees, whether members of the union or not, fairly, in good faith and without discrimination. This duty applies to virtually every action that a union may take, in dealing with an employer as your representative, including collective bargaining, handling grievances, and operating exclusive hiring halls. For example, a union which represents you cannot refuse to process a grievance, because you have criticized union officials, or because you are not a member of the union. Note that the duty does not ordinarily apply to rights a worker can enforce independently, such as filing a workers' compensation claim, or to internal union affairs, such as the union's right to discipline members, for violating its own rules. Time for a few questions. In a union organizing campaign and election, the appropriate bargaining unit is defined by the National Labor Relations Board. The most important determinant of a bargaining unit is Community of interests. 
Community of interest is an important criterion used by the National Labor Relations Board to determine whether a group of employees should be allowed to act as a bargaining unit. A bargaining unit is determined when the unit shares a community of interests in wages, hours, conditions of employment, similarity in skills, interests, duties, and working conditions, etc. Which of the following is likely to be considered a supervisor, by definition of the NLRA, and subsequent interpretations by the NLRB? Employees who are accountable for the performance of other employees. In deciding to vote yes in the union election, Natasha is not particularly interested in becoming a union member, but strongly believes that the union will improve the wages and working conditions at her company. Natasha is likely to vote yes in the election, because her level of dash is high. The answer is union instrumentality. For already unionized workers, the biggest weakness in U.S. labor law is the ability of employers to hire permanent replacement workers. What type of strikes are lawful? Economic strike. If the objective of a strike is to obtain from the employer some economic concession, such as higher wages, shorter hours, or better working conditions, it is called an economic strike. Economic strikers retain their status as employees, and cannot be discharged, but they can be permanently replaced by their employer. If the employer has hired bona fide permanent replacements, who are filling the jobs of the economic strikers, when the strikers apply unconditionally to go back to work, the strikers are not entitled to reinstatement, at that time. However, if the strikers do not obtain regular and equivalent employment, they are entitled to be recalled to jobs for which they are qualified, when openings in such jobs occur, if they, or their bargaining representative, have made an unconditional request for their reinstatement. Unfair Labor Practice Strike or ULP Strike If the objective of a strike is to protest an unfair labor practice, committed by the employer, it is called Unfair Labor Practice Strike, or ULP Strike. ULP strikers can be neither discharged, nor permanently replaced. When the strike ends, ULP strikers, absent serious misconduct on their part, are entitled to have their jobs back, even if employees hired to do their work, have to be discharged. The Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, LMRA, also known as the Taft-Hartley Act, amended the NLRA. The LMRA prohibits unions from engaging in several unfair labor practices such as jurisdictional strikes, a work stoppage undertaken by a union, to assert its members' right to particular job assignments, and to protest the assignment of disputed work, to members of another union, or to unorganized employees. Wildcat strikes, a work stoppage that occurs during the term of a collective bargaining agreement, without approval of union leadership, and in violation of a no-strike clause. Solidarity or political strikes, work stoppage by a union, in support of a strike initiated by workers in a separate organization, or for political reasons. Secondary boycotts or picketing, when a union that has a primary dispute with one employer, pressures a neutral employer to stop doing business, with the first employer. Closed shops, a form of union security agreement, where membership in a union is a condition for being hired, and for continued employment in an organization. Monetary donations by unions, to federal political campaigns. The LMRA gives states the right to pass right to work laws, which banned closed shops, and union shops. A right to work law states that no person can be compelled, as a condition of employment, to join or not to join a labor union, nor to pay dues to a labor union. The LMRA allows for permanent replacement of union workers, who embark on an economic strike. 
The LMRA established the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, FMCS, for labor dispute resolution, conflict management, and mediation services, in the private, public, and federal sectors. The LMRA gives the President the right to declare a strike as a national emergency, and to declare an 80-day cooling-off period. The evening before a union election, an employer held a company picnic for its employees. Attendance at the picnic was required, and the company president gave a passionate speech, urging employees not to vote for the union. The most likely reason the NLRB would consider this a violation of the NLRA is. The picnic amounts to a captive audience meeting, held within 24 hours of the election. When unions negotiate contracts with one company at a time, each modeling their settlements, after prior contracts negotiated in the same industry, or covering similar jobs, it is known as Pattern Bargaining Bargaining power can be best described as The ability to secure another's agreement on your own terms a unilateral change as it pertains to bad faith bargaining occurs when an employer changes wages, benefits, or other terms of employment, without first bargaining with the union. The key difference between mediation and arbitration is a mediator has no authority to make a final and binding decision. The Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act of 1959, LMRDA, or the Landrum Griffin Act, was enacted due to several instances of union leadership corruption, and unethical conduct. The LMRDA, regulates labor unions' internal affairs, operations, and their officials' relationships with employees, and employers. The LMRDA, grants equal rights to all union members, and protects their interests by promoting democratic procedures, within labor unions. The LMRDA, established, a Bill of Rights for Union Members, reporting requirements for labor unions, union officers, employees, employers, and labor relations consultants etc., standards for the regular election of union officers, safeguards for protecting labor union funds, and assets. The LMRDA requires unions to hold secret ballot elections for local union offices every three years and every five years for national or international union offices. The LMRDA provides for review by the Department of Labor DUL, of union members' claims of improper union election activity. The LMRDA ensures union members are protected against abuses by a Bill of Rights, which guarantees freedom of speech and assembly for union members to discuss union matters. For the LMRDA, convicted felons were barred from holding union office, unions had to submit annual financial reports to the DOL, and union officers must act as fiduciaries in handling the assets and conducting the affairs of the union. The LMRDA restricted increase in union dues and assessments, to only those that were approved, by majority vote of the union. Union dues are regular payments, made by union members, as a cost of membership. Union assessments are one-time only payments, made by a union member to the union, to cover a special program, or activity. Minimum standards must be met, before a union can expel or take other disciplinary action, against a member of the union. The LMRD covers both workers and unions covered by the National Labor Relations Act, and workers and unions in the railroad and airline industries, who are covered by the Railway Labor Act. The Office of Labor Management Standards, OLMS, of the Department of Labor, enforces certain provisions of the LMRDA. Other provisions may only be enforced by union members, through a private suit in a federal district court. Underscore change, 
is when the employer changes wages, benefits, or other term and conditions of employment, without bargaining with the union. Unilateral The goal of integrative bargaining is Unify the common interests of management and the employees, in a way that makes everyone better off, than before. When employees strike to force an employer to accept a union as their bargaining agent, it is called a underscore strike. Recognition An employee who wants to work, instead of strike, has the legal right to Cross any picket line and, or resign from the union. If the primary goal of the dispute resolution system, is putting pressure on negotiators to settle and guaranteeing a solution, then underscore is best. Arbitration A union security agreement is a part of a union collective bargaining agreement, in which an employer and a union, agree on the extent to which the union may compel employees to join the union, and whether the employer will collect dues on behalf of the union. Examples of union security agreements include Closed shop, the employer agrees to hire only union members. Prospective employees must already be union members, before they can be hired. Closed shops were made illegal by the Taft-Hartley Act. Union shop, the employer may hire anyone regardless of their union membership, but new employees must join the union within a certain time, usually 30 days, or be fired. Agency shop, employees are not required to join the union. However, all non-union employees must pay an agency fee, also called fair share, to the union to cover the costs of collective bargaining. A 2018 Supreme Court ruling, Janus v. AFSME, declared collecting agency fees from non-consenting employees illegal, in the public sector. Dues Checkoff, a contract between the employer and union, where the employer agrees to collect the union dues, and other monies, from workers directly from each worker's paycheck, and transmit those funds to the union, on a regular basis. In a right-to-work state, it is up to each employer to workplace, to decide whether or not to join the union, and pay dues, even though all workers are protected by the collective bargaining agreement, negotiated by the union. Over 27 states in the U.S. have banned union security agreements, by passing right-to-work laws. A union workplace in a right-to-work state, is called an open shop. A maintenance of membership clause in a collective bargaining agreement, requires employees who are covered by the agreement, to maintain their membership in the union, for the duration of the contract. Note that even when a union security agreement is in place, employees who object to full union membership, may pay only that share of dues used directly for collective bargaining, and contract administration. Known as objectors, they are no longer full members, but are still protected by the union contract. Unions are obligated to tell all covered employees about this option, which was created by a Supreme Court ruling, and is known as the Beck Right. Time for a few questions. The typical collective bargaining agreement covers N underscore period. Three year. What percentage of union contracts specify that employees can only be disciplined or discharged for just cause? Over 90%. Just cause discipline and discharge, seniority rights, compensation, and grievance procedures are all examples of underscore granted in contracts. Employee rights? Employees covered by a just cause clause have the right to insist that there be valid, dash reasons for being disciplined or fired. Job related. The most important effective card check recognition procedures, on union representation elections, would be to decrease the amount of time it would take to know whether the union won. The Civil Service Reform Act reformed the civil service of the federal government, 
and distributed its functions primarily among three new agencies. The Office of Personnel Management, OPM. The Merit Systems Protection Board, MSPB, and the Federal Labor Relations Authority, FLRA. Title VII of the CSRA, also known as the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, created the Federal Labor Relations Authority, FLRA. The statute allows certain non-postal federal employees to organize, bargain collectively, and to participate through labor unions of their choice in personnel decisions. The Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute protects federal employees' rights to organize, bargain collectively, and participate in labor unions of their choosing, or to refrain from doing so. AULP is conduct by agencies or unions that violates rights that the statute protects, or the rules that it establishes. Employees covered by the statute have the right to form, join, or assist a union, or to refrain from such activity, without reprisal, including the right to organize a union in the workplace, act as a union representative, seek union assistance, file or pursue a grievance, refuse to form, join, or assist a union, be fairly represented by their union. Federal Agency ULPs A federal agency commits a ULP when it violates rights that the statute protects. Examples include threatening an employee that her career would not go much further if she proceeds with her grievance, transferring an employee to an undesirable job because she filed a ULP charge, eliminating employees' compressed work schedules without giving their union notice and an opportunity to bargain over the change. Refusing to grant an employee's request for a union representative during an investigatory Weingarten interview when the employee reasonably fears discipline. Union ULPs A union commits a ULP when it violates rights that the statute protects. Examples include refusing to process a grievance because an employee is not a union member, threatening an employee for filing a ULP charge refusing to negotiate in good faith with an agency, calling, participating in, or supporting a strike, work stoppage, or slowdown. Now, time for a few questions. Duty Company's contract with the union specifies that supervisors are to make promotion decisions by selecting the most senior employee from a pool of qualified employees. The company is allocating promotions using seniority as a determining factor. Dash is not generally determined by seniority rights under a union contract. Determination of which grievances will be pursued by the union. Katsina Factories recently sold their plant to a larger company. The union contract specified that any new owner would need to recognize and bargain with the existing union at Katsina. This contract provision is called a successorship clause. Underscore procedures make it difficult to transfer and promote workers around on the basis of skills and merit. Seniority based. Beck rights allow union workers to pay only that portion of union dues that goes to Contract Negotiations and Administration The major difference between the National Labor Relations Act, NLRA, and the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute is that the NLRA applies to private sector employees and the statute applies to federal employees. A key difference between the NLRA and the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute is the scope of the collective bargaining process. In the private sector, employees are entitled to bargain collectively on wages, hours, benefits, and other working conditions, but federal employees can only bargain collectively with respect to personnel practices only. 
Federal employees cannot negotiate on wages, hours, employee benefits, and classifications of jobs. Another difference is the NLRA allows private sector employees to engage in concerted action, such as strikes and work stoppages. But the Federal Service Labor Management Relations statute prohibits strikes, regards work stoppages as an unfair labor practice, and specifically excludes from the definition of employee, any person who engages in a workplace strike. Another difference is the NLRA allows private sector employees to engage in appropriate forms of picketing, but under the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, it is an unfair labor practice for labor unions to call or participate in picketing that interferes with the operation of a federal agency. Only informational picketing is allowed under the statute, and it must not disrupt the operations of the agency, nor occur while employees are on duty. Now, let's look at a few questions. Critics of union shop agreements, argue these agreements violate employees' individual freedom, by depriving them of a free choice about where to work. These critics argue they are protecting workers. Right to work. The purpose of a management rights clause is to ensure that management maintains decision making authority over traditional management functions. The notion that management retains all rights to make decisions on issues that are not explicitly addressed in the contract is called the reserved or residual rights doctrine. The last step in the grievance process for nearly all union contracts, in both the public and private sector, is usually final and binding arbitration. The role of the ombudsman does not include make a determination as to which party is right. The last step in the grievance process for nearly all union contracts, in both the public and private sector, is usually final and binding arbitration. The role of the ombudsman does not include make a determination as to which party is right. Although there are some key differences, grievance arbitration closely resembles a formal judicial process. The cost of arbitration is usually split between the union and management. Weingarten rights describe the right of a unionized worker to have representative present at a disciplinary meeting.